Peace, peace, and welcome to Cook on Quarantine. Uh, you know, I actually really enjoy all of the guests that I have on the podcast. They they all are uh, accomplished, interesting. Uh, they have a lot of depth. But this is my first time having somebody on that you know, I deeply, truly admire. Someone I consider uh, a mentor who I affectionately call Sensei. <laughs> He's not only been a, a mentor to me, but uh, um, I think made himself available to connect with policymakers from all walks of life that are looking to do good work in education and 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 on city councils and the state senates. Mr. Ali is uh, the president of the Compton Unified School District. Uh, he's also been a leader uh, statewide and nationally on issues related to improving outcomes for Black youth, uh, improving governments, no matter where they are. And so, um, so this is an honor for me, you know, uh, to, to have him on this platform, to hear his story officially, to share it with all the folks that enjoy the podcast, and to learn some how-to lessons for all of us looking to level up <laughs> in, the, in the political world. So, Mr. Ali, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Cook. <laughs> the Honorable Cook doing some phenomenal work in advancing the cause of equity in education in San Francisco. Very much appreciative to be invited and also to represent Compton today on your exemplar podcast. I wanted to get a lot of practice in before I asked you to come on. So like, I had like 40 opportunities to practice to make sure I was ready before uh, before I asked Mr. Ali to grace us with his presence. Uh, let's just do a little bit of level setting. Like, you, So you, you're, on, you're the president of the Compton School Board. How long have you served on the Compton School Board? I was elected to the Compton Unified School District Board of Trustees in 2007. Prior to that, I served as a member of the Compton Unified School District Personnel Commission. Prior to that, I served as a member of the Compton Community College District Personnel Commission. And so I've been involved within the area of appointment and or elected leadership in Compton since the early 2000s. And so I've served as president, actually the longest serving president in the history of the Unified School District dating back to some 1970, 71 the longest serving president. And I'm very thankful and very grateful to the people of Compton, as well as my colleagues for entrusting me uh, with the gavel to lead as well as guide and help to shape public policy for black and brown children within this community. There are people that say, oh, he shouldn't be the president. He, they flip flop. But the significance and importance of, of, of presidency within school districts, number one, the understanding of public policy from business side from the operational side and the management of the agenda. It is very important that when you serve in a capacity within a school district, you, you, you truly shroud yourself and you develop yourself within the government code as well as the board policy to understand the management of the system. School districts are complicated. The budgets are vast and voluminous. There's multiple funding streams and as a president, and even as a member of the board, it's very important and very significant to understand that because oftentimes you're lay people, you're lay individuals, you're elected. Now you're charged with managing a government agency that has a budget of oftentimes 300 plus million for the company Unified School District with the largest employer in the area. We have more land than any government entity, probably within... 15 square miles. That's very significant and very important. This is an economic driver within the Compton community. So we're providing an educational service and benefit to children. We're an employer. And then we've offered a tremendous amount of, 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 of opportunities for community-based organizations and others to be franchised as a part of what we're doing here by transforming the lives of folk within Compton and the Compton community if you will. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's important to, to point out. And um, I think what people don't often understand how large the government agency employee, employer, how large of an employer it is in the cities where, you know, government operates. It. Yes. Same thing with San Francisco. Yes. yes. And, uh, our city, you know, our county um, and city, we, we, we're a large employer in the area. 
Um, but you didn't always, you know, you have a long history in doing education policy, but, uh, and you look like a very young man, but you weren't born as president. You had a life before that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Let's, let's get a little bit too. So you, were you born and raised in Compton? Born and reared in Compton, came through Compton. There's some of the most infamous yet notorious uh, days and Growing up in Compton in the 80s and 90s, you saw a lot. You saw a transition from black to brown. You saw a transition uh, from infamy to prosperity, tremendous high levels of crime, a school district that was taken over by the state, a community college that was taken over by the state, a city that's pretty much been in perpetual and continual economic distress. And you grew up through that, you develop a thick skin, you develop an understanding of how to effectuate public policy in a manner that's productive. You, you've had a chance to see many people do it wrong. Mm -hmm. Now you have an opportunity to correct that wrong and do things right, which is what we've been able to do within this system. We bowled some of the highest graduation rates in the history of the unification. Prior to SARS coronavirus 2, we had a budget surplus which rivaled many a positive certified budget, no layoffs projected, black student achievement up exponentially, addressing the issues with respect to special education. We've reclassified more students with an English language uh, development, English language learners, if you will. So we've done a, a yeoman's job. And all of that, when I look back in the rearview mirror, that wasn't a comp and unified school district I attended. Literally, we'd be sitting in class and they'd be working on the school, open up the school. It wasn't the preparation and, and renovations done during summertime. Schools would be open. Children would be running around. It just was not the measure of accountability. It was not the measure of academic excellence. We were not elevating then. We were descending. And today, we have an opportunity to boast a measure of elevation, which places the Compton Unified School District on par with many suburban school districts that are exceedingly affluent. And we've done that through being fiscally prudent, but also partnering with ancillary organizations to help expand the mission. Again, the days I came up in, tremendous gains. And I'm gonna just tell you something, when I hear people talk today, about restorative justice and response to intervention and diversion programs. I wish all of that existed back then because the school system could have most certainly been a catalyst for positive change during those days, as opposed to expelling, suspending, and exposing students to the road paved to prison. The school to prison pipeline started in many communities probably 1973 on up until today. And so right here in Compton, we had a chance to witness that. And so when I hear people talk, I'm oftentimes reminded, well, you know, I just didn't arrive for yesterday. I've had a chance to see, I've had a chance to see the bad. I've had a chance to see the ugly. I've had a chance to see the horrific. And then now I get a chance to experience the elevation. And so I'm very grateful to that. And, you know, and I, and I know that even as things have improved, every district still faces challenges. Like, in, at least in San Francisco, we still have a disproportionate amount of uh, African-American Latino students that are suspended and expelled, even though the total number has dropped. Uh, we still see, I mean, at least in our district, we, San Francisco still has the widest achievement gap in the state, right? Having gotten to know you, I see how much you commit to your work on the school district. This is like volunteer work you know yes. for the most part volunteer yes. work and like you are really uh dedicated and not you know every time we hang out you're working on something related to your district as you right. do stuff um so a part of the part of the reason why i bring up those persistent challenges is because uh you took on one of the first opportunities we got to collaborate was around uh, the california association of black school educators which um, you sort of stepped into the leadership of and and a lot of that work around the blueprint, which I wanted you to kind of touch yes, on. Yes, 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 yes. To this like continued disparity when it comes <laughs> to improving achievement for black youth. So talk a little bit more about uh, CAPSI, California Association of Black School Educators, and, and how you sort of came into that position, what, what the work consists of now. I'm very fortunate to have been the founder 
of the California Association of Black School Educators. And so <clears throat> this is pretty much the preamble. We're looking around California, and what do we see? 6% Black folk within the state, 6.5% of Black folk within charter and traditional schools. We needed an organization that married everyone who, what I always say affectionately, if you're eating off the Prop 98 trough, we need to bring everybody together, charter, traditional, and community colleges, to really talk about and look at instructional best practices for Black children. Now, I don't want to get off into school choice. I don't want to get off into charter versus traditional. That's not my fight. Our fight and our struggle is how do we move the needle for Black children? How do we move them with respect to concurrent and dual enrollment? CAPSI, as well as the Compton Unified School District, because we pushed a tremendous amount of legislation in Sacramento. My school district leading AB 288, which deals with concurrent dual enrollment. And so CAPSI's mission solely is to leverage instruction of best practices from around the state so that school districts can collaborate around ways to enhance the quality of learning for Black children. Not political. This is instructional. And we're looking at how, as, as leaders charged with providing intrinsic solutions for families, we can collaborate. There's some things that charters are doing well, we can extract. There's some things that traditional schools are doing well, we can extract. There are pockets of innovation, there are diamonds within California, and we must unearth. So when you look at, at the 2019 report released by the UCLA's Transform School Initiative, there's a tremendous amount of statistics that they throw out. Very startling statistics with respect to black students in Los Angeles County who fall to the bottom of the list of most achievement indicators. So for example, 42% of black students have not met the standard on the SBAC for English. 54% of black students have not met the SBAC standard for math. Now, met the standard on the SBAC. That's significant and that's troubling and all of us ought not simply be aghast, but all of us ought to see it as a call to action to find some ways in which to crowdsource knowledge, crowdsource information, crowdsource opportunities, and then begin to allow that to permeate and promulgate throughout various districts where there are high pockets and high concentrations of black children. And even if they're small, Let's still find ways in which to help those folk too, but 6.5% but cannot be at the bottom of the barrel. They cannot test below children with special needs, and we say that's okay. We're going to spend all of our time focused on all of the ancillary and not focus on what's before us. It's important and significant to fight all the fights that we have to deal with today, but if children can't read, if they can't compute, they will not be able to partake in this global marketplace, because black children are not just competing against white suburban children, they're competing against children all over the world, every single solitary place throughout the world they're competing against. So we have to make certain that we are in a position to address that. So the, the need for the organization and, and bringing that convening together, um, like the, the need is definitely stated, it's stated in the numbers, it's stated in the life outcomes, it's stated in the multiple areas within the, the community that you've built um, right. through through the convention, you know, like yes. what, what is what, what it's going to look like now, when did it come back via COVID, um, yes. all that's sort of to be seen, but I felt very fortunate to have seen it at least once because <laughs> it's the third year, I think uh, this, the last one I went to was the third year that it was uh, happening and the types of people you brought together to speak on various issues uh, that alone was incredibly inspiring. So, you know, so there's the, the, the why behind the organization, but actually participating was a very empowering experience. And um, oh, you want to say something before? No, I was just going to accentuate your point. You know, I know you know this because I believe you one of the most gifted young minds in California. And you've actually started something before. But you started it full time and you actually worked it full time. Mm -hmm. CAPSI came about as a result of a discussion in Washington, D.C. with Vernon Billy and me. 
Vernon Billy is the executive director of the California School Board Association. He's a black man. And Vernon said to me, I'll paraphrase, I'm disappointed in you, Ali. Why are you disappointed in me? He says, all the work that needs to be done to impact black children, where are you? I said, well, I'm in Compton. He said, I ask again, where are you? I'm in Compton working diligently and working assiduously. He says, no, nah, my brother. There has to be a way that we leverage opportunity. It has to be a way that we bring about a discussion of the inequities that black students have and look at those outcomes and look at treatment, look at treatment, almost a prescriptive plan, if you will, that will assist these students into moving forward. And that will only be done through public policy, through school boards, superintendents, colleges, uh, boards of trustees of community colleges, as well as college presidents or superintendents, and even charter school executive directors. It won't happen unless there's folks at the table and everybody at the table together. I then thought about it. 90 days later, we pulled together a team of very gifted and talented practitioners, and we held our first conference in San Diego. And then, of course, we held the second and we held the third. And I'm very proud and very pleased of the work of the CAPC Board of Governors, for which you sit. And there are a host of other folks who are represented throughout California. These are Black school board leaders. Many of these folks are professionals and practitioners within their own right as attorneys, as ecumenical leaders, as public administrators, as, as private sector entrepreneurs. But we all have one thing in common, the desire to see a blueprint in order to leverage those opportunities for Black children, period. And we know it can be done, and we're doing exactly that. One thing I want to get into you with was about the, the, the lawsuit to get rid of the um, SAT, uh, <laughs> which, you, which you've been uh, spearheading. Um, and uh, it, it'd be great to get sort of like the impetus behind that. But before we do that, I just, I just kind of want to talk about your first race, your first race, okay? Because like, you know, people, um, I was mentioning, I called you sensei. <laughs> and like the work of governing, right, as you know, is very different than the work of running a campaign. Yes, yes, yes. And you ran when you were young. You were young. I mean, you're still a young man. And... Um, how old were you when you first when you first were elected? I was elected, I believe, at the age of twenty-eight or twenty-nine. And my first campaign, you're gonna find this very interesting. My first campaign, and I'm very fortunate and very blessed to even say this. I had the opportunity to work with none other than a legend in California, the first black and the only black who served as Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Mervyn Diamondly. And he's since gone on to glory. And I can tell you this unequivocally, what a force to be reckoned with him. And to have someone like him support me for school board, he's always been instrumental in cultivating young black talent. And I thank him for that. Let me just kind of just take a step back. And let me pay homage to a few people. Mm -hmm. I worked for another black woman who's no longer with us, former member of Congress by the name of Juanita Millinder McDonald. She also saw interest in me. And she supported me immensely. I worked for her in Washington, D.C., and then later on supported her in the district office. And then, of course, I left Congresswoman McDonald. And I wanted to work for another black woman named Dolores Zarita, who was a member of the city council. And I happened to serve on the school board with her daughter, Satra Zarita. And so Dolores Zarita, the honorable distinguished councilwoman, retired here in the city of Compton, who also ran the Mills and Wolves program for multiple, many decades, mm -hmm. took an interest in me. And so I had an opportunity and was fortunate to work with some phenomenal people around the area of public policy, was able to work on a multitude of issues. I later on left the council's office and became a project manager in redevelopment in Compton. So I was responsible for residential commercial development, had a chance to really understand a lot of that. But I had a chance to really learn and understand redevelopment agencies and the inception. So when Jerry Brown came along and he dissolved them, I understood why. I understood why. It was very crystal clear to many people it was somewhat of a conundrum, but I understood 
why the governor at the time did what he did. So I'll tell you this, my first campaign, it was truly a hard fought because I ran against an incumbent, an incumbent who has since passed, a phenomenal gentleman, I must say. And I just simply believe that there needed to be a different direction within the school district. And I truly ran against, at the time I would dub an oligarch. There was a tremendous amount of folks on the board. Many of those individuals worked within the system. So they were very ancestral and they had a tremendous amount of relationships. I just believed not that any of these folks were bad people or they were doing anything nefarious or anything that was deleterious to the system. I just believed that the district needed to shift the paradigm. During those days, I was working for Raytheon. I have a background, STEM-focused background that I cultivated over time. And so if our students are going to play again in the global economy and be taken serious, we most certainly have to look far and wide and understand that there has to be a reliance upon instructional best practices that most certainly move students to where they want to be, which is a segue to the SAT, ACT. We'll get to that in a second. And so I ran, took the incumbent out, 2007, I'm on the board. Mervyn Dimerly swore me in, and what an honor that was. And so I believe I've been doing exactly what I set out to do, which is enhance and make this school system far better than what, than what I found or where I found it when I was initially elected. And I will say it has been nothing but exponential growth since I've arrived to this school board. Nothing but exponential growth. Hard fought but exponential growth nonetheless. When you, when you talked about the collaboration that uh, CAPSI is looking to um, cultivate around advancing Black student achievement, this is one of these unfortunate things. Like one of the realities of, of just policy work is that it involves politics and the, the, the future and like the opportunity for, for Black children should be apolitical. Like there should be no political tie associated with how we go about improving outcomes is just not the reality of the work that we're in. And so we, you know, we, we're realists, we deal with the reality and, um, and we take what comes, but then yet and still we, we build around these ideals, which is sort of what CAPSI represents, right? Building around these ideals that this should be a political, we should have something that works for our children, no matter where they are in our state. So when you're, when you're taking on some of these very entrenched battles, like it does r- require, a, a masterful understanding of how politics works, right? So you took on you're taking on the college board with the SAT. Yes. And uh, you know, SAT is like as ingrained in America as like, you know, frosted flakes. I don't know. It's just like, yes, like we all yes. know the SAT. Yes. Yes. And so, and so you yes. decided to sue um yes. uh you know this 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 group that we've all uh, I don't know, going through, matriculating through high school and the college, we all dealt with this test. And right. there's a ton of ex- a ton of research about how black students inherently, or how they sort of like, they do the stereotype threat thing that, that Claude still talked about. And we perform not as well. That's why they got rid of the sort of clicking off your race and ethnicity before you took the test, because they saw it, right. was, um, it, it helped sway performance. But you, you decided to take this on. So... So explain why. So we have to truly reimagine or reframe how we view education, most certainly. I believe the way that we oftentimes talk about education is always within uh, the lens of some statistic. You know, we don't talk about the social emotional aspect. We don't talk about the access and opportunity. Yeah that exist. We oftentimes look, look at that as a phrase, but, but it's absent suggestions how to close it, right? Uh, we always talk about campus climate and, and, and the need to look at school safety, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't bring any resources to the table to really articulate a position or how we can truly help students within that respect. I must say, having had a chance to examine a tremendous amount of thought, leadership, discussions, discussion points, 
colloquies, seminars, tons of suggestions. We thought about it and said, wait a minute, uh, there's an issue and we need to really address it like now. We need not wait for an election to come around or we need not wait for someone who we believe is going to win office. We need to do it right now or we need to do it immediately. And so we moved diligently to sue the ACT and the SAT and believe that it ought not be a factor of admissions to college. It is not a predictor of student success. It is nothing more than a barrier, nothing more than a hedge that's built up in order to keep marginalized folks on the other side. And because many children within black communities may not have the resources, may not have the financial means or the wherewithal to pay for the tutors, the supplemental assistance, the augmented learning that might go in tandem with scoring high on the SAT and ACT, they fall behind. Why not look at other predictive values? Why not look at other qualitative or quantitative assessment and or measures which will most certainly dictate how well the student would do in college. The objective for us is to get students into a collegiate environment. We already know that absent a college degree, children with our community, in many cases, in many cases, I'm not referencing those who don't specialize in mathematics and go on to a trade school and become a trades person. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about many who may not have properly had a future plotted out for them. They're going to find themselves in a menial job. They're going to find themselves undergoing the vicious cycle of poverty for which many of them currently exist today. Why not break that? Why not show students and families that we are indeed, we're not guardians of the bureaucratic order, but what we are are Trojans and warriors and centurions who will make certain that we fight for what we believe will transform students' lives and what we believe will uplift this community. And the notion that education is a civil rights, we've already checked that box. We know that to be the case. What we believe and what we know is true that all children within the urban communities of California and Compton is not excluded from that discussion ought to be allowed to participate in the collegiate experience which will allow them to learn, which will allow them to grow, allow them exposure to other people. Let them come back here. Let them transform this community. It can't just be interlopers. Mm -hmm. We have to grow that talent from within. And if we live in California and we have the community college system available, certainly it is. But after that, we have the California state system. And we have the pinnacle, the UC system. Our students ought to be able to take advantage of that. Their families pay taxes. And I believe they have a constitutional right, they have an inalienable right to further their life's mission, its life's journey, and nothing should serve as an impediment therein. I'm getting the best of Mr. Ali today. He's getting like all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate the powerful message. You know, and I, I, when, when you told me that sort of like this was in the works and I saw the news reports about it, because I, I kind of want to get a status update around where things are at right now. But I just, as you were talking just now too, I was thinking like, oh yeah, I, I took, you know, I remember I took weekend classes to prepare for the SAT. Um, I, I, we paid for it several times to retake it and retake it. And like I mentioned, it's so ingrained. I didn't even think like, oh, we can get rid of that? <laughs> like it's possible to cancel that? <laughs> it just seemed like, um, you know, it was just like a part of what we had to to, to contend with. So some universities here and there, uh, more progressive universities have said, you know, we're not going to use it any longer. Some universities got rid of grades. You kind of hear about this case by case example with different colleges. Right. Uh, but you said uh, we're going to cancel the or I don't know how you would put it necessarily. <laughs> we're going to end it. So where so you, you sort of lay out the case for why get rid of it. Um, what is the actual legal work involved? and starting it, and where does it stand today? So there's a lawsuit that's still underway. Even though the California, the University of California system did say that they're looking at a multitude 
of other options, perhaps test optional, uh, which is a word that you'll probably hear a lot about in, in the upcoming months. Perhaps looking at the SAT or the ACT as some form of scholarship criterion, et cetera. There's a tremendous amount of banter. What we're talking about in our lawsuit, which the lawsuit has not, has not been resolved, we're talking about a full elimination and the reliance and the reliance upon other measures to weigh a student's ability to compete within college. Now, there's a list, there's a list of universities, Abilene Christian University, Alabama A&M University, Boston College, Bentley, the list goes on and on. Brown University, Ivy League, I might add. Many of these universities have made SAT scores optional. Now, we're talking about if you're doing it as a result of SARS coronavirus too, then let's eliminate in its entirety. Everybody has had a chance to look at and assess what we believe is very simple. There are other measures. Let's look at GPA, other ways in which we can measure and bring about a predictive evalu uh, evaluation of a student's success and our ability to compete within the UC system. So that's, you know, I look forward to continuing to get updates about the progress of that, the complete elimination of it. That's, that's, um, that's really exciting work. Uh, you are in, are you in your, f your fifth or fourth term on the school board? So I just was reelected this, this March. So this is probably my seven, it's my fourth, fourth term. Fourth term. And I believe this might be it. I might be hanging up the chalk. Well, I might sure. be taking the board down. <laughs> <laughs> nah, well, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are going to try to convince you otherwise. And if 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 if, if that ever does happen, there'll be like a school or a jersey. There'll be some way to commemorate your service. <laughs> um, um, you know, Compton is like a a very important place in hip hop because of all of the like all of the arts that came out of the city. And yes. um, and a lot of a lot of hip hop, which I know we didn't get kind of get into your personal story and your own personal struggles and some of the stuff you have to overcome, but that's not uncommon in a lot of our black communities. And you know, and it's not uncommon to have setbacks. I think one of the um, one of the great lessons in leadership is like you know what happens when we fail. Like, do you have any uh, stories? like major lessons that you, yes, um, as a result of a setback that you had since being in office? Yes, and so I never look at failure. I never look at, at, at losing or a loss. I look at it as learning. Mm -hmm. 2014, I challenged my very good friend, Mike Gibson. Mike Gibson was running for the assembly and I knew he was running for the assembly. And I decided to stick my hat in the ring. And I learned. Today, Mike is the assemblyman and I, respect him immensely. I support him emphatically. And I believe that he's been a good support for me, for the Compton Unified School District, as well as the Compton community. And so he and I had a chance to talk and we met and we talked for hours. And one thing is for certain, we all have a place on the bus. And I believe that my place is exactly here within the Compton Unified School District on this board of trustees. And I believe that most of the things that I would have wanted to do in the legislature, I've actually been able to do from right here on the school board. Eliminate willful divine suspension and expulsion within my community. Provide trauma-informed education coupled with mental health support right here in my community. Fight the behemoth, Goliath, the University of California system to oppose the SAT as well as the ACT. Just this Tuesday past, passed a resolution I authored establishing the Office of Black Student Excellence with a focus on the instructional, the psycho, and the social well-being of black children. So I'm serious about this. And Sacramento would have been cool, but as far as I'm concerned, Compton is better. And I believe that my place is here and the lesson 
was clear. The lesson was clear. Oftentimes, we believe that we need a much larger office to have a reverberating presence, a force, a voice. But if I look back at history, it wasn't that Rosa Parks believed that she was doing anything that was monumental. She was tired. Want to take those shoes off and simply catch the bus home. She had no idea. She had no idea that it would resonate in the manner in which it did to make an economic dent within history. And so oftentimes, the little steps that we make, little steps that we make, are oftentimes so tectonic, we just simply, simply do not know it. Yeah, well, uh, I'm still sort of unpacking the lessons from my, uh, you know, learning attempt at running for city council in, in San Francisco, which uh, you were, I was fortunate to have your insight and guidance on as I was trying to take on that. And there was a lot of lessons that, uh, <laughs> that, we, <laughs> that we like kind of went over together. Um, and, I, and I bring that up, too, because you end up giving insight and advice to you know, elected officials from all walks of life all over the country. Can I, I just want to touch on a little bit of, around like the national work you're involved in. Yes. Yes. I kind of get into before we close this out, we kind of talk about what's, what's, what's the next four years look like in Compton. Um, can you just sort of uh, elevate some of that work? I served as two years in the capacity as the national chairman of the council of urban boards of education, <clears throat> some 110 plus districts some of the larger urban districts throughout our country. Served as a member of the National School Board Association Board of Directors. And today I serve as the president of the chairman-elect. They use, I think it's president, I believe it's president-elect mm -hmm. of the National Black Council of School Board Members. All that national work, it led me to author the National School Board Association's equity policy. I authored that policy and I shepherded that policy through the board of directors, which was approved. Now we're talking about an organization that was on the wrong side of history in 1954 during the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And today, for the organization to stand as a beacon and as an organization that's committed to academic excellence for children of color, it says a lot. As the chairman of the Council of Urban Boards of Education, a significant focus of mine was the full funding of the Individual Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, which deals with full funding for special education. When the act was passed, Congress stated that they would fund some 40%. Today, it has not been funded any more than 18%. And that is indeed a travesty. And if in fact it were funded at a much greater level, I do believe that money would be able to be used to impact children of color within urban America, as well as, as well as white children in rural America, we so often forget about. And so I'm very proud of that work. I'm very proud of the convenings that took place, national convenings and New Orleans, as well as Las Vegas during those days. And we're able to pull together hundreds, if not thousands of, of, of educational leaders from the urban space, superintendents and other ancillary uh, staff and thought leaders within the space to really focus a message around what our mission and what our plan ought to be for ensuring that we deliver the resources needed for children to excel and to achieve. It's one thing to talk about equity, almost as a cliche, but it's another thing to effectuate that change through public policy, which is, there's an accountability, there's an accountability measure to ensure that the superintendent, as well as the executive staff, they're actually utilizing that policy to, to drive and deliver change. And so, again, very thankful and very grateful have been fortunate to do a tremendous amount of work with the National School Board Association. I've worked very closely with members of Congress, as well as other elected leaders from throughout 
of the country. And those were some very good days. And I look forward to assuming the helm as the president of the National Black Council and then furthering that work to truly benefit black children within America's urban settings. Thank you for sharing that. And so, and so you have, so it's not like you're not busy, you know, <laughs> you have your work as a school board president of Compton, you have this sort of national convening work, you have CAPSI. Um, and so, and you have, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not just like a, a president in name only, like you're actually persistently pushing things to improve outcomes in your district. So I'm sure you probably have like a, a 20 point, like, <laughs> goal list or something like that for <laughs> for your next few years. Like what what's 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 coming up? Um, we're obviously de- dealing with uh, COVID, and we have to reopen schools. Can you talk a little bit about what Compton is planning to do around that, and then what your priorities are for in the coming year? So so Compton has pretty much pivoted to a, a digital district, and it's it's very important, very important for us to learn the new normal and lead within that vein. You know, fortunately, we've not had the foresight to plan for this, but we're in it. And I believe that Compton, like many other school districts around California, we've all done a stellar job. We've all done a stellar job at at trying to address the needs of, of students. I I will say that something that's very significant and very important to me leaning forward is what we do to truly ensure that children with special needs receive the free and adequate public education as called for in the law and that we have a moral obligation to provide. That's extremely important. What I also want to make certain is that we continue to push through and continue to challenge and, and, and press the state, press the state. The state has a constitutional obligation to provide a public education for children. And we have to make certain that it is not just about a funding discussion, but it's also how the state continuously burdens districts with mandates that they don't pay for. And so there's a significant challenge for mental health support. The state has to be able to step in and provide some assistance therein. Mm -hmm. Relaxing other categorical dollars, that's something that we're going to have to challenge the state on in order for us to best appropriate that money where we know it ought to be spent in order to help children as well as families. Very significant Mm -hmm. and very important. In Compton, I'm very fortunate to have secured $10 million from Dr. Dre. I was able to get $10 million from our good friend, Dr. Dre, and so I want to be able to cut the ribbon of a brand new Compton High School. When the high school is completed, it'll probably be one of the newest high schools in all of California. And so that's something that I'm looking forward to. In addition, is figuring out how distant learning can truly impact students who may have not been able to get it in the traditional sense. Many students are dealing with a tremendous amount of of stresses. And oftentimes the school environment might not be conducive, but allowing them to look at different learning modalities and to be able to experience different learning options might just suit them well. So again, we have a tremendous amount that we can do to reimagine and reframe how education will look in Compton within uh, the, the near future. We've done a phenomenal job at truly pushing and prodding the equity discussion by appropriating resources and then measuring, measuring those resources and then looking at how we've been able to move the needle for many students. Big discussion around California, big discussion around the country with campus climate and how we reimagine school safety. That'll be a discussion, a worthy discussion around my community within the impending weeks as well as months, because I firmly believe and I firmly stand by 
the need for school resource officers and police, that might be an antiquated concept in 2020. And we may need to look at other ways in which to reallocate those fundings for student services. Perhaps might be time to reduce officers on campus, might be time to look at those roles and how we can limit and how we can reconfigure. I'm in a position to change that. And I'm going to advocate, I'm going to advocate, I'm going to advocate. And I have a tremendous amount of community-based individuals and organizations who are leaning in within that vein. And oftentimes people come to audience comments and they state their piece and they want you to respond and get into this colloquy. Well, and you can't, you really can't. But I want folks to know that I believe them what you're saying. I believe that we ought to reallocate. We have to reimagine. And the word I want to use is some folks are saying defund. I'm saying let's reimagine. Let's reimagine what that looks like. We could defund and the money can go elsewhere, but let's reimagine what it is and what we want it to be. And that only comes through the exercising of democracy, meaning bringing people together to listen to various voices, listen to various opinions, listen to the diversity of thought that might exist, and then let's come out with something that, that we can agree with. So again, 2020 has been a very interesting year, and I believe that 2021 will be even more interesting. I'm loving the measure of advocacy that exists within this country today. I want to make sure that that advocacy is channeled, and I want to make sure that Black children, I want to make sure that Brown children, I want to make sure that poor white children truly benefit from all that we're talking about. And once the election is over, we don't believe we've done enough and it's time for us to retire. I want us to continue pressing the gas and continue pressing the mantle forward because I believe that the change we seek, the change we see is the change that's within us. But that light of that flame cannot be extinguished simply because your candidate won or another candidate lost. I have a couple more minutes with you and I want to respect uh, our time together. Um, I have a few rapid fire questions and first before we get into that I just okay. want to say I appreciate the um t- you sharing your story uh you sharing you sharing your work and um taking on challenging issues so thank you for this time um few rapid fire ones you ready yes sir all right now is this a yes or no no it's not yes or okay no. okay okay I mean it's whatever you want it to be <laughs> okay right. so uh what what's a book you would recommend a book that I would recommend Hmm. Have a lot of good ones. This is a pretty thick read. They came before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Uh, I'd also read uh, the spook that set beside the door. Hey. <laughs> I'm glad you read that. That's a very good book. <laughs> okay. And and I think that Sam Greenlee, and I do believe the spook that set beside the door can frame your mental existence for the rest of your life. Mm. You know, sometimes if you read the Bible, it says steady to be quiet. Mm -hmm. What that really means is you ought to be reading and learning. Mm. A lot of times folks are quick to want to give a perspective or an opinion, but you've actually missed, you miss a whole opportunity of learning Mm -hmm. because you were too busy pontificating and tweeting. Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I do a lot. (laughs) Um, Do you meditate? I do. What is, uh, what's your advice for Kanye West? My advice for Kanye West is to utilize some of his talent and money to come down here to Compton and and (laughs) help us by investing in our students. I'd ask you to match Dr. Dre's $10 million. I'd ask you to raise it from 10 to 20 million so that we might build additional performing arts centers or additional theaters where students can come and they can have an opportunity to leverage their intellectual prowess and the measure of creativity that comes from the arts. And so I would ask you to do that. That's my challenge to Mr. West. Look at you. Always, always on point. <laughs> um, what's, uh, do you have a motto? 
You know, as a matter of fact, I do. I do. And 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 Thomas Paine said it best: "Lead, follow, or get out of the way." Simple: lead, follow, or get out of the way. What personal weakness can you forgive in someone? I believe all of us make mistakes, but I cannot forgive incompetency. I can forgive you if you're disloyal. But when you're incompetent, that's a different level of negligence with deleterious effects. Last and final question. Who's going to win the presidential election? Well, I'll say this. I have no crystal ball. (laughs) I have no crystal ball. (laughs) Got it. And at this point, the polls are all over the place. The truth of the matter is I really don't know who's going to win. I have absolutely no idea. But let me tell you what I want to be the victor. What I want to be the victor is that the members of the House as well as the members of the Senate will immediately convene and put together a piece of legislation which would deliver school districts resources to address the issue of SARS coronavirus 2. And I would also ask the federal government to relax the restrictions placed upon Titles 1, 2, and 3 so that school districts can utilize that money in order to provide immediate services for children as well as employees during this pandemic crisis. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> this is, uh, I deeply appreciate the time. Like I mentioned before, um, I know we can do, you could probably do your own, you should do a class on, uh, on public service and politics and, uh, and policy making. Hopefully the world will get that opportunity to learn from you. Uh, in a similar way that I have over the over the year that that we've got an opportunity to to really connect. Um, uh, thank you again for taking the time today. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Peace, peace, and thank you for listening to another episode of Cook on Monday Morning. I cook on Monday morning. We believe if you own Monday morning, you can own the week. If you own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. My name is Steve Ann Cook, and I had the great pleasure today of, as you know, listening to and learning from Makai Ali, who is who serves as the president of the Compton Unified School District. I'd like to thank President Ali for taking the time to join me on this day to share more about his story, his work, and the change he's looking to drive, not only for the city of Compton, but for uh, communities across the country with his work at CAPSI, which I'm affiliated with, the California Association of Black School Educators and the national work he's doing to support and promote policies that have uh, an an education equity framework in mind. I'd like to thank him for his time. He mentioned uh, a few books uh, that are in the link. Uh, The links are in the the description. If you wanna check out those books that Makai referenced. Uh, If you're still here with us, I hope that you would take a moment to like and subscribe to Cook on Monday Morning. Since the pandemic has started, as you know, we've upped the amount of episodes that we've done. So instead of just Monday morning, we're releasing new interviews on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A great way to support this message of getting our our, our folks that are doers and have motivational, inspiring uh, messages to share is to subscribe to the podcast. Um, I hope that you'll take a moment to do that, like and subscribe and share it with a friend if you think it's relevant to them. The Cook on Monday Morning brand is owned by the Luther Harris Holding Company. Uh, Luther Harris was my great grandfather. I named my strategic and consulting practice after him. And uh, he built a, a legacy on creating something out of nothing. He shared some lessons on leadership that inspired me to you know, start this podcast and to start my work in consulting. I work with uh, nonprofits, startups um, to help their help them meet their strategic goals around growth. I also work with large companies to either support their work around diversity hiring or to help them drive impact in the communities that they that they operate in. And so, if um, that is something that is, is of interest to you. I'd be happy to talk more. Just e- email me, info at Steve on Cook. We can set up a time to chat. When you get a minute, you also can go to my website, steveoncook.com, and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, I send out a newsletter that shares additional insights and lessons that are 
more truncated and cover a variety of different topics. So uh, if that's of interest to you, just sign up for the newsletter. It's really quick. It's info with Steve on Cook. Um, it's a great way to support the podcast. While you're at the website, you might notice that there's a bookshelf. And the bookshelf has various books that I recommend. If you click on one of the books and go through the link to Amazon, it's an affiliate link. And so before you do any of your Amazon shopping, you know, go through the link and then it will help support the podcast by giving a little kickback to the the show. And, you know, we don't ask for viewer donations. Um, We're looking to sort of uh, earn money you know, in a, in a way that doesn't require a direct ask um, of donations. So that's a good way to support the podcast. We also are creating merchandise. So if this podcast, uh, this message is interesting to you, represents a mentality that, that you want to be a part of and you want to support the work that we're doing here, the merchandise is going to be really, really awesome. I hope that you will consider uh, purchasing it. Um, it's a great way to support the podcast also. We'll be doing a, a night out for single mothers. So, you know, it's just a nice token of appreciation and, and love for all of our mothers that are doing it on their own. Uh, the whole idea is that I will cover a night out for a single mother and a friend of hers. Uh, we can also uh, look into covering childcare. I know it's a pandemic, so we have to kind of work out what that's going to be like, uh, just to make sure everything is safe. But if you know of anybody that you think would be deserving, if you're a listener, if you know somebody that qualifies or, you know, you think could use a night out, just email me, info at stevonk.com. Uh, tell me three or four sentences about the person, send their contact information, and uh, we'll go from there. We're trying to do it at the rate of two times a month. So it's just a nice um, summer, hopefully in the fall, thing we can do to help to show some appreciation to the folks in our community. I'd also like to thank the people that make this podcast possible. Our videographer, David Topete. Incredible, incredible work. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. I'd also like to thank Fernando Cinco Marquez for editing the newsletter. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. This podcast was started as a testament of love to the people that keep our cities moving and keep our cities great. They are our first responders, folks like our firefighters, police officers, EMT workers, our social workers, our our educators, um, our school lunch workers, the people that clean our streets, our custodians, our bus drivers, like my father, who drives for Muni in the city of San Francisco. Um, Everyone that's in blue collar work, that's doing the hard work, uh, the tough work, this podcast is for you. This podcast is for our employers, people that are making sacrifice, creating opportunity, uh, helping our economy grow and our and our communities thrive. For to our employers, our doers, this podcast is for you. It's also for our gig workers, the folks that have uh, showcased how essentially they are at, since the start of the pandemic. They stock our shelves. They deliver our food. They pick us up in ride shares and get us to where we need to go while exposing themselves to this vicious virus. This podcast is for you. And if you haven't gotten enough of me, uh, and I hope that you haven't, and you already like to subscribe and you want to continue to connect, I'm on social media, LinkedIn at Steve on Cook, Twitter at Steve on Cook, Instagram at Steve on Cook, Facebook at Steve on Cook. Um, you know, this has been a beautiful journey. I'm glad we're on it together until we see each other again. Peace, peace, and we out.